Poplar, but all early Christian basilicas of mainland Greece as well, for no written sources survive that will indicate the right that followed therein. What makes things even more complex is that the general geographical area under ex examination, Illyricum Orientalis, was Greek speaking but belonged ecclesiastically to Rome until the eighth century when it was placed under Constantinopolitan jurisdiction. Did this shift in ecclesial jurisdiction also translate into a ritual change in the Illyricum in general and also the Christian Parthenon? Regarding the former, there is very little evidence. Regarding the latter, there is none. There is, however, another extremely valuable source for the study of the liturgical life of the Christian Parthenon overlooked by liturgical scholars, and that is the corpus of Christian inscriptions on the columns of the Parthenon. 232 such inscriptions have been recorded. Unfortunately, many of them have been lost. And they constitute the single most valuable source for the history of Byzantine Athens. Of these, 104 are prayers, while 64 are epitaphs, providing us a written record of Athenian ecclesiastical history. A large number of inscriptions combined with about 80 more inscriptions in the Propylia and a smaller number in the Erechtheion indicate that the Christian Parthenon was an important devotional site. I argue in this presentation that a liturgical reading of these inscriptions can reveal a great deal about liturgical life in the Christian Parthenon. In fact, this evidence on the columns of the Parthenon supported by some archeological findings and a single literary witness allow us to place the Athenian cathedral among those churches of the Byzantine empire that celebrated what is called the Asmatikia Kolutheia or the Sung Office, more popularly known as the Cathedral Office of Hagia Sophia, the great church of Constantinople. I also argue that by the eighth century, the cathedral rite was definitely established in the Christian Parthenon and was celebrated until the submission of Athens to the Franks in 1205, when it became the Roman Catholic Cathedral of Athens. And here you, you see one of five Latin inscriptions that can be found on the walls of the Parthenon. One needs to keep in mind that what we call today the Byzantine rite is really a hybrid rite a conflation and synthesis of this particular cathedral office of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople with the liturgical rites of the Anastasis Cathedral in Jerusalem and its monasteries, especially that of St. Savas in the Judean desert. This process of conflation and synthesis was a gradual one called or named by liturgists as the Studite Synthesis that flourished between the end of iconoclasm in the ninth century and the sack of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade in 1204, and the neo sabaitic synthesis after 1204. So what is called today the Byzantine Rite, our tradition, bears the traces of this long evolution, has many features of Jerusalem liturgy, and is quite different from what was celebrated in Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, or in our case, in the Christian Parthenon. The Parthenon was converted into a Christian church probably sometime between the end of the fifth and the seventh centuries, a conversion often seen as one of the instances of violence and destruction of beautiful classical buildings and temples by uneducated and fanatical Christians. This view, I would argue overly simplistic and largely inaccurate, is reflected in the short video playing in the new Acropolis Museum, where the 1,000-year Christian history of the monument is mainly presented as part of the gradual demise of the classical building. This negative approach to the Byzantine world has also been reflected into the 19th century, catastrophic excavations of the Ottoman, Frankish, and Byzantine layers of the Parthenon, catastrophic, because no records were kept of what they were digging through. 
fact, there are still mounds of rubble dating from the Byzantine era on the Parthenon and similarly at Delphi that archaeologists back then dug through, threw on the side, and they're still there, and they need to be studied. Fortunately, modern attitudes have changed, and research by Professor Manolis Cores, the former head of the conservation team of the Parthenon, allows us to assemble a puzzle of architectural fragments and provide us with a description of the changes made to the building over time for converting it into a Christian church. We are not completely sure what the use of the Parthenon was in the classical era. It was definitely a grandiose victory monument for the defeat of the Persians and a statement of Athenian supremacy. But even its use as a temple has been challenged by some scholars. In addition, the cultic center of Attica was not the Parthenon, but Ellipsis. And even on the Acropolis, the Erechtheion, not the Parthenon, was the destination of the Panathenaic festival. In any case, in its original use, one would enter the Parthenon from the east, right here, proceed into the east chamber, which would house the Chryselephantine statue of Athena Parthenos, right here, and the west chamber, number three, functioned as a treasury. Upon its conversion to a Christian church, the axis of the building was inverted. The eastern entrance was walled up, and a large semicircular apse was built on the eastern side, which in the 12th century was expanded into the form of a semi-hexagonal outer surface. The area of the apse was elevated, and a typical Byzantine synthronon was built in the apse, consisting of a number of steps with a throne at its highest point at the center of the apse. The throne still survives and is part of the exhibits in the Acropolis Museum. This is actually the only reference in the Acropolis Museum that makes reference to the Christian life of the Parthenon. The altar table was made out of marble and surmounted by a ciborium of four pillars. A low chancel barrier about six meters from the eastern wall separated the altar from the nave. The eastern end of the aisles also contained tables separated two by a low chancel barrier. The nave had three aisles demarcated by columns and galleries were created by, insta by installing elevated wooden floors above the side aisles. In the center aisle, approximately in the middle of the nave and offset to the north, a circular marble ambo or elevated pulpit stood on a solid pedestal of which the base, this here, and a thoracion, what you see here, uh, still survive. The latter is exhibited in the Byzantine Museum of Athens. At a later date, the location of the ambo was changed, a move that is significant for our study and we will discuss shortly. This original ambo was replaced with another, now in the middle of the nave, right here, and standing on six small columns, of which the bolts and recesses can still be seen on the ancient floor of the Parthenon. Toward the west, the treasury, right here, was turned into an narthex, entering to which was possible not only through the west door, but also through three more doors opened on either side. A baptistry was placed in the northwestern part of the narthex, right here, divided by partitions with two doors. The rectangular font was made out of four slabs of marble set upright along the sides of a gap created by removing an entire slab of the ancient floor. On the outer west walls of the par Christian Parthenon to the left of the narthex entrance was a fiali, right here, comprising a marble basin surrounded by columns and the space between columns in the outer colony of the Parthenon was filled in, creating a roofless ambulatory, possibly to compensate for the absence of an atrium. You cannot see the outer colonnade, but you have columns all the way here 
this is what I was referring to. The church was also decorated. The apse of the building was adorned with a mosaic of the Virgin Mary holding Christ, of which 188 tessere survive in the, in the British Museum. In addition, an extensive iconographic program was executed, most likely in the 12th century, with icons painted directly on marble surfaces. Unfortunately, very little survives of what that would allow us to reconstruct an iconographic program. Only faint traces of these icons survive, pointing again to the disregard of early archeologists and restorers for the Byzantine history of the building. These images, most of them visible in the 19th century and even the 1960, when this image was, was taken, are now lost. This is the image. You can see the Virgin Mary holding Christ, flanked by two angels. This is my picture in 2011, virtually gone. Furthermore, we have no surviving icons of Panagia Athenotisa. However, a possible indication of what it, it, might, it might be like is found in the lead seals of metropolitans of Athens, like that of Mikhail Choniatis, metropolitan there in 1182-1205. In the seal, the Virgin Mary is of the Odigitria type and is actually titled Athinyotisa. You can see here, E. Athinyotisa. And this is a seal that I recently found and I would like to draw your attention to the specialist of seals among us, Bishop Joachim. Um, and I'm amazed of how much information one can glean out of seals. A seal of, his, of, the, of, the pre, of a predecessor of Michael Choniatis, Nikolaos Agio Theodoritis, Metropolitan of Athens from 1166 to 1175, bears the same image, but with a title, Mitir Theu i Athenais. Uh, and this is the, the first um, time I encounter the title Athenais for the Virgin Mary of Athens. And I found this a couple of weeks ago, so this is really brand new. The floor plan of the Christian Parthenon was obviously conditioned by the pre-existing building and had to adapt to Christian needs and building practices to the limits of that structure. This explains the presence of the baptistry within the actual church, as usually, but not always, the baptistry was a separate building annexed to the church. It is also difficult to interpret the purpose of the side chambers in the eastern end of the building flanking the altar. but separated from it, as we have no evidence as to what their use was. However, there is one architectural feature of the Parthenon, the ambo and its location that can prove extremely useful for our purposes. The original ambo of the Parthenon was placed off center to the north or left as we face east toward the altar. This was true of a number of early Christian basilicas of mainland Greece and may reflect the local liturgical rite, whatever that might be. We have no clue other than our archeological evidence. At any rate, the fact that a large and heavy structure like an ambo was later moved to the center of the nave on the east-west axis of the church can only point to a significant change in the liturgical practice of the Christian Parthenon. I believe that the change implied by this architectural evidence, in other words, the shift of the original ambo from somewhere here to smack in the center, uh, is the adoption of the cathedral office of Hagia Sophia. One cannot help but make the connection with the centrally located ambo of Hagia Sophia. In other words, I would argue that when Athens came under the ecclesiastical jurisdiction of Constantinople in the eighth century, the cathedral church aligned its liturgical rite with that of the cathedral office of Hagia Sophia. And in fact, evidence of the celebration of that cathedral rite office in the Christian Parthenon from the eighth century on can be found on the columns of the Parthenon. 
we already mentioned that among the 232 Christian inscriptions of the Parthenon, 104 are prayers, a fact that confirms the Christian Parthenon was a monument of prayer. And if we take into account that these inscriptions were most likely read out loud by visitors and pilgrims, it immediately would transform that building in a sacred space of continuous prayer, even when no liturgical rites were celebrated. In other words, local faithful and pilgrims would inscribe their names on the columns, knowing that any future visitors would read them out loud, as was customary in those days, thereby offering a prayer on their behalf. And we shouldn't be scandalized by these inscriptions. It was a custom of the day for pilgrims. Of course, if we caught someone inscribing a prayer on the walls of our chapel, we would run after him or her, right? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but that's what they did back then, and that's what we were studying. Among these 232 Christian inscriptions recorded there, there is one that I believe gives us the most direct and clear witness to the liturgical tradition and practice of the Christian Parthenon, and that is inscription number 197 on column 52, situated on the southwestern corner of the exonarthex of the Christian Parthenon. So basically, it's this column that's behind the scaffolding right here. You can barely, barely see. This was a popular column with 33 surviving inscriptions, second among, second among the columns of the Parthenon in its number of extant inscriptions. Inscription 197 was not inscribed directly on the marble column, but on a very thin layer of plaster with which the column is covered. That's true for the majority of the inscriptions, and that's the reason why we have lost many inscriptions. Uh, the cataloging of the inscriptions was done um, over the years, but was completed by Orlandos and Varanusis um, on site uh, during uh, the Nazi occupation of Greece, and it was published in the 70s. Um, today, on site um, study has shown that some of these um, um, inscriptions that have been recorded have now been lost, exactly because the plaster kind of like peels off. The dimensions of the inscription itself are approximately 30 centimeters high and approximately 20 centimeters wide, and the bottom of the inscription is approximately 222 centimeters from the current floor. The height of the letters of the inscription vary between one and two centimeters. Unfortunately, the inscription itself is not dated, nor do the publishers offer a date. However, Erki Sironen, a specialist on a Byzantine epigraphy from Finland, was kind enough to examine this inscription for me and suggested a date around 800 AD with a margin of at least 100 years. In other words, between 750 and 850, and definitely before the 10th century. At a closer look, it is easy to identify this inscription as a table. It has a heading, there are three columns, and it, uh, the table is divided into two parts. So you have the heading, you have three columns, one, two, three, and it's clearly divided into two parts. The first column on the left indicates in abbreviated form the day of the week in sequence, in sequence from Monday to Sunday, with Sunday mentioned twice. The second column, again in abbreviation, indicates a musical mode, a different one for each day, placed in no particular sequence. And the third column provides an incipit for a hymn. The table is meant to be read horizontally in the following way. Ti Deftera, ichos plagios tu tetartu, ekekraxasi sotir tu kosmo. On Monday, in tone plagal fourth, I have cried out to you, Savior of the world. In other words, this table is a guide to the day and tone of certain hymns to be chanted. 
And according to the heading of the table, these are the daily hymns of the second week. After the list of hymns and before the dividing line between the upper and the lower part of the table, we find the phrase, tatis tesarakostis, translated Lenten or of Lent. It complements the heading, troparia tis vita evdomados imerinata tis tesarakostis, or Lenten daily hymns of the second week. The lower part of the table shares the same structure with the upper part, has the same list of days, though Sunday is mentioned but once, has a list of musical tones, Saturday and Sunday are not assigned a tone, but it lacks a list of hymns, giving instead a supplication for prayer. Prayer for me, brother, through the Lord. In other words, it is obvious that the table was left incomplete and has survived as such. This becomes clear if we transcribe the inscriptions, in the inscription. So here you can see the three, ta the three columns, Monday, the, the day of the week, the tone, and the incipit of the hymn. The incipits provided in the table are hymns, troparia, or responses, as indicated both by the presence of the word troparia in the heading of the table and by the fact that the musical tone corresponds to each one. What is strikingly significant is that the sources that allow us to identify the incipits reflect, reflect the cathedral office of Hagia Sophia, as described in the Tipcon of the Great Church during the 9th, 10th centuries. Our most important sources are two Byzantine musical manuscripts presently housed at the National Library of Athens, but are originally from Thessaloniki, the National Library of Greece, 2061 and, and 2062. And for the importance of these manuscripts, you can ask uh, uh, Father Karanos, um, who is your musicologist. Additional valuable information may, glean, may be gleaned from three Byzantine ecology manuscripts, Sinai Greek, uh, New Finds, Megalogrammatos Graphi 22 of the late 9th, early 10th centuries, Grotta Ferrata Gamma Vita 7 of the 10th century, and the 12th century Vatican Greek 1554. These invaluable sources enable us to identify all but two of these intrepids. can be identified with a hymn, Twenty-two syllables, I have cried out to you, Savior of the world, listen to me and save me, I pray. Both the day it is to be used, a Monday, and the musical tone, Plagal Fourth, coincide with those indicated in the Byzantine musical manuscripts from Thessaloniki, while in the Eucology manuscript, Grota Ferrata Gamma Vita 7, it belongs to a list of Lenten responses. It's assigned to a Tuesday, and the musical tone is Plagal Second. The hymn, obviously inspired by Psalm 140, verse 1, functions as a response to Psalm 140. Την έπαρση των χειρών μου can be identified with a hymn, Την έπαρση των χειρών μου, Κύριε, θυσίαν πρόσδεξε, Εσπερινήν και σώσον με φιλάνθρωπε. The raising of my hands, Lord, accept as an evening sacrifice and save me, lover of humankind. Both the day that it is to be used, a Tuesday, and the musical tone, Plagal Second, coincide with those indicated by the Byzantine musical manuscripts from Thessaloniki. While the Eucology uh, manuscript, Grota Ferrata, Gamma Vita 7, it belongs to a list of Lenten responses and is assigned to Thursday, and the musical tone is Plagal Second. The hymn, inspired by Psalm 140, verse 2b, functions obviously again as a response to the psalm. Κατεύθυνον την προσευχήν μου can be identified with the hymn Κατεύθυνον την προσευχήν μου Κύριε δέω με και σώσον με. Direct my prayer, Lord, I pray and save me. In this case, although the day this response is to be used is the same, Wednesday, the musical tone is different uh, when compared with those indicated in Byzantine musical manuscripts from Thessaloniki. And again, 
Now, this is inspired by Psalm 140, verse 2a, also used as a response to that psalm. Ότι προσέ Κύριε ή Κύριε οφθαλμή μου can be identified with a hymn Ότι προσέ Κύριε ή Κύριε οφθαλμή μου φύλαξον και σώσον με for towards you Lord my eyes are directed protect and save me in this case too the day this response is to be used is the same a Thursday but the musical tone is different Plagal fourth in the inscription verse second when compared with those indicating the Byzantine musical traditions from Thessaloniki the hymn is inspired again one from one from Psalm 140 verse 8a and it functioned as a response to the psalm. Τον αγγελικόν λόγον υπεδέξω. I have not been able to trace and identify the hymn that this incipit belongs to. Part of its content, τον αγγελικόν σου λόγον υπεδέξω, you have received the angelic word, may allude to the annunciation and allow us, allows us to assume that it is a response containing a reference to the Theotokos. A possible source for the recon reconstruction of this hymn may possibly be the Theotokion of the Aposticha for matins of the Feast of St. Theodosia of Constantinople, celebrated on May 29. Also to be sang in Plagal second tone, second mode. And here the common elements are underlined and Possible later additions are italicized. The incipit number five of our inscription, uh, the first column to your left, and the first verse of the hymn are virtually identical, that's the second column, the middle column, as ton agelikon and archagelikon are the same in content, rhythm, and number of uh, syllables. Ton agelikon or archagelikon. The fact that the hymn, as it survives in the Office of St. Theodosia, has 44 syllables, much longer than the hymns presented in our inscription, and that both phrases, Cherovikos thronos anedichthis and enagales vastasas are introduced with ke, allows us, allow us to suggest that they are later, could be, later additions, interrupting the flow of the hymn in order to embellish the hymn's praise for the Theotokos. The hymn, in its original form, could well be the shorter, Ton Agelikon Logon Ipedexo Theotoke, Tin Elpida Ton Psychon Imon, which amounts to 24 syllables, roughly the same amount of syllables with all the other responses that we have seen. The corresponding response in the Byzantine musical manuscripts from Thessaloniki, Theon Exus Arcothenda Egnomen Theotoke Parthene, Αυτόν ικέτευε σωθήνετας ψυχάς ημών, 32 syllables, though different is also addressed to the Theotokos and shares the same musical mode, Plagal second. We can then assume that it too functions as a response to Psalm 140. Την σωτήριόν σου can be identified with the τροπάριον την σωτήριόν σου έγερεσιν δοξάζομεν φιλάνθρωπε. We glorify your saving resurrection lover of humankind. The response clearly referring to the resurrection of Christ. The day, Saturday, and the musical tone third are common to our inscription and the Byzantine musical manuscripts from Thessaloniki. This hymn, too, functions and as a response to Psalm 140. Ένδοξε αϊπάρθανε Θεοτόκε. According to the musical manuscripts, this hymn reads, Ένδοξε αϊπάρθανε Θεοτό και μήτυρ Θεού προσάγγε την ημετέρα προσευχήν το Υιό Σου και Θεό ημών. This important troparion that has survived in expanded form is still in use in the Byzantine liturgical tradition in the contents of small compline. We are very fortunate to be able to trace the development of this troparion in our sources or what I hypothesize is the development of this troparion in the sources. Manuscripts Holy Cross 40 of the 10th century, Patmos 20, uh, 226 of the 9th, 10th century, both of the Tipicon of the Great Church. The 14th, 15th century, National Library of Greece 2061, and the current uh, Byzantine Office of Compline are, what happened here? Oh, I apologize. I don't know 
why this happened. It froze. I apologize for this technical glitch. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. There it is. Wonderful. So, in comparing the different version the different versions, one can notice two things. First, the, the hymn has undergone what I call a Christological correction. Second, the, the hymn has expanded over the ages, reflecting a growth in Mariological piety. One is tempted to, and, and I acknowledge this is a historic, an anachronism, one is tempted to interpret the version of our response in Holy Cross 40 in an historian way, the first column to your left. Notice the absence of the term Theotokos, together with Mary being called Mitir Christu, dogmatically a slippery slope, if you recall uh, the whole debates around the Council of Ephesus in 431. We can also trace the process of making the hymn Christologically mainstream that took place, I would argue, in two phases. And this is obviously hypothetical, my own reconstruction. Initially, with the addition of the term Theotokos, as you can see um, uh, in um, uh, the third column, and the replacement uh, in the second and the third column, and the replacement of Christo, Christu, with Theu. Theotokos, mother of Christ, mother of God. Um, and then dropping Mitir Theu, made redundant by the presence of the term Theotokos. Theotokos, mother of God, is kind of like a repetition. It's redundant. So mother of God is, is struck out. The hymn also involved making endoxe to hyperendoxe by adding the adjective of logimeni and by expanding the petition part of the hymn, a reflection of development in Mariological piety. Therefore, given the date of our inscription and the presence of the term Theotokos in the Incipit, I would suggest that possibly our Incipit corresponds to the hymn as it is found in Patmos 2.26. That will be the second column. And this too would function as a response to Psalm 140. While I have not been able to identify this incipit, it is clearly addressed to the Virgin Mary. The fact that in our inscription we have two responses for Sunday both addressed to Mary, can be a reflection of a greater piety towards her. After all, the Christian Parthenon, the Cathedral of Athens, the Panagia i Athenotisa was dedicated to her. In all the cases that we have been able to identify the incipits, these are found in the sources functioning as responses to Psalm 140 in the Cathedral Office. And in fact, as we have already seen, numbers one to four of the above responses are textually related to Psalm 140. But what was the place and function of Psalm 140 and its responses in the cathedral office? The key to understanding this cathedral office is the cathedral psalter, remarkably different in structure and execution from the psalter that we use today, or the Jerusalem psalter. The cathedral psalter was divided into eight fixed antiphons and 68 variable antiphons. The eight fixed antiphons, a total of 10 psalms, were Psalms 85 and 140 at Vespers, Psalms 3, 62, 133, 50, and Psalms 148 to 150 in Orthros on Morning Prayer, and Psalm 118, 
divided into three antiphons for Sunday Orthodox. The remaining 140 psalms were divided into 68 variable antiphons, the odd numbered antiphons having Alleluia as their response, and the even numbered antiphons having a three word response built in the following way a verb in the imperative, a personal pronoun, and the vocative Lord. For example, and this is from the Clude of Psalter, one of three cathedral psalters that have survived. The response to Antiphon 2 um, that contains Psalms 4 to 6 was, Have compassion on me, O Lord, ikdirison me kirie. And you can see here, identifying the three Psalms that comprise the Antiphon with the response of the Antiphon. The total number of Vespers in the Cathedral Psalter was 2,542, roughly half the number of the verses in the current Psalter, arranged by whole verses. The Psalms in the Cathedral Office were always chanted. The 68 variable antiphons, that's the 140 Psalms, were distributed between Vespers and Northros so that all would be chanted in one week Proti or Mia Evdomas. Then in the following week, Deftera or Etera Evdomas, those antiphons are, um, assigned to authors of the first week would be chanted in Vespers. And those assigned to Vespers of week one would be assigned to authors of week two. Thus, forming a two-week cycle. Within this two-week cycle, a different response for each day of the week called Kekragari is assigned to Psalm 140, which was a fixed Vesperal antiphon. And similarly, a different response is assigned for each day of the week called Pedicostari to the Psalm 50, a fixed Matins antiphon. We are fortunate enough that the list of the two-week cycle of responses, Psalm 140 and Psalm 50, survives in the two Thessaloniki manuscripts now housed in the National Library of Athens that we talked about earlier, uh, numbers 2061 and 2062. It is in this context that we can understand the heading of the inscription, long introduction for one sentence. The heading of the inscription was Troparia tis Defteras Evdomados in Merina, daily hymns of the second week. And if we compare our inscription with a list of responses to Psalm 140 in our two famous now Byzantine musical manuscripts, we might have the answer as to why our inscription was left incomplete. If we put the list side by side, the left column are the responses on the inscription, the right from the, uh, from the manuscript, manuscripts. We immediately notice that the responses in inscription 197 are of the first week, not of the second, as our inscription says. In addition, these responses of the, are of the regular cycle, not of Lent, as indicated in our inscription. Finally, there are two inscriptions, Ton Agelikon Logon Ipedexo, underlined in bold, and here parthene kemitiri to kimilion to logikon that are unique to our inscription. Therefore, the inscriber, realizing his mistake, and this is my hypothesis, and not being able to correct it, left the table unfinished and placed a short supplication in the lower cell. This then allows us to reconstruct hypothetically the process of putting the inscription on the column. I believe this took in five steps, took place in five steps. First, he picked the column and the spot. In the second, he drew the lines. In the third step, he inscribed the heading, the days of the week and the musical modes. Um, you can see the days of the week here and the musical modes in the unfinished section. Four, in the fourth step, he filled in the hymns in this cell right here. And in the fifth and final step, realizing his mistake and not being able to correct it, he inscribed a supplication. We can safely then conclude 
that our inscription is a reflection of the use of the cathedral office in the Christian Parthenon. But we have some more evidence that supports our hypothesis. Our conclusion is supported by additional evidence found also on the columns on the Parthenon. These are inscriptions of titles and terms associated with the cathedral office and inscriptions of hymns stemming from the tradition of the great church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. We have already seen that there was a two-week cycle in the cathedral office, and our inscription is a reflection of that cycle. We have evidence from sources of the cathedral office of Constantinople that the readers and cantors and clergy of Hagia Sophia and its dependent churches were divided based on this two-week cycle. Three inscriptions on the Parthenon point to this direction. Inscription number 126, which commemorates the death of John, the deacon and domesticos of the second week. On Saturday, April 27, in the year 793. Inscription number 146, which mentions a certain Germanus domesticos of the first week in the context of a supplication of the Virgin Mary. An inscription 141, which reads, Deacon and Domesticos of the second week. Strategios, here we know. Uh, anyway, that was his name. In other words, the use of the two-week cathedral office cycle in the Christian Parthenon is also attested to in inscriptions that, it make, that make mention of the title Domesticos in its ecclesiastical use, that is the head of the body of cantors ser serving Panagia Thinyotisa. In addition, there are 13 inscriptions that make mention of the title Skevophylax, the keeper of the sacristy. Of these 13, nine were also deacons, one also a presbyter, one also a monk, one also a head cantor, and for one, only the title Skevophylax uh, survives. The overwhelming number of deacons with the title Skevophylax may serve as an additional pointer towards the cathedral office, since the Skevophylakion chamber was a characteristic feature of the cathedral office. It was where the gifts of bread and wine were brought by the people, where the deacons prepared them, and from where the deacons again brought them in procession in and through the church and handed them over to the presiding celebrant. In Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, the Skevophilikon was an external edifice near, near to but separate from the main body of the church. Obviously, the Christian Parthenon lacks such an outside Skevophilikion. That, however, could be explained by the fact that originally it was not a Christian building. The proposed ad adoption of the cathedral office in the 8th century could have led to the use of one of the side chambers uh, on the east part of the building, possibly the one on the northeastern side as an indoor skevophilikion, adopting the cathedral office to the realities of a pre-existing building. In addition, there is a third group of inscriptions that may indicate a Constantinopolitan connection. A total of eight inscriptions in different contexts refer to the Athenian cathedral as the Megali Ecclesia ton Athenon, the Great Church of Athens. The title Great Church is applied in the sources predominantly to cathedral churches, but particularly to Hagia Sophia of Constantinople and Hagia Sophia in Thessaloniki both edifices that celebrated the cathedral office. Finally, there are a number of inscriptions that preserve hymns or parts of hymns associated with the liturgical life of Panagia Finoitsa. Thus far, I can firmly identify two such hymns that establish further links with the cathedral office of Hagia Sophia, the festal hymn of Pentecost and a festal hymn dedicated to two saints. There is one last piece of significant evidence that would merit our attention, particularly because it's from a non-Athenian source. It is a comment made by the well-known canonist, Dimitrios Komatinos, Archbishop of Ocrid between 
12.16 and 12.36 regarding the cathedral and hagiopolite offices. And I quote, you have the text on the, on the screen. There are two established practices that contain and dictate the prayers, the hymns and the spiritual odes of the ecclesiastical office. The one practice, which is also the more perfect one, is predominantly called the sung office. It is not widespread, but is limited to a small number of places which we know. That is the great church of the prosperous Constantinople, the famous cathedral of Thessaloniki, and ha ha, the far famed cathedral of Athens. The second practice, that's the other practice, now called Hagiopolitis, is common to all as every church of the Orthodox Church honors it. In this comment, reflecting the situation before, right before the Fourth Crusade and its aftermath, the Cathedral of Athens is acknowledged as far famed and is listed together with the cathedrals of Constantinople and Thessaloniki as the only churches at his time that still followed the cathedral office. The cathedral, the Christian Parthenon, was a far-famed cathedral, the shrine of Panagia Athenotisa, the destination of numerous pilgrims, full of life, artistic creativity, and liturgical services, above all, a place of prayer. The Christian Parthenon is not a narrative of destruction. The Parthenon never shed its pagan appearance and history. Rather, it is a story, I would argue, of continuity with its past. It is a story of symbiosis of Hellenism and Christianity. It continued to function as holy space. One would argue even more so than in antiquity. And the, inscription on the, and the inscriptions on the columns of the Parthenon bear witness to it. In this study, we embarked a long journey of approximately 800 years, exploring a hitherto unknown but very significant aspect of the life of the Parthenon, the Christian rituals celebrated within its walls. Inscription number 197 on column 52 of the Parthenon is indeed a very important witness to the liturgical life of the Christian Parthenon, supported by other inscriptions, as we saw, by archeological evidence, as we saw, and by the witness of Dimitrios Komatinos. The evidence, I think, is clear and straightforward and points to the celebration of the cathedral office within the walls of Panagia Finiotisa, the great church of Athens, for at least five centuries. That is from the middle of the eighth century to 1205. Furthermore, the dating of our inscription between 750 and 850 not only provides us with the terminus antequem of the adoption of the cathedral office in the Christian Parthenon, but it also makes it the earliest textual reference to the cathedral responses of Psalm 140. Thus, we can now add the Christian Parthenon to the group of the great churches, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Hagia Sophia in Thessaloniki, that witnessed the celebration of the cathedral office. Without a doubt, the column has spoken loud and clear. Thank you. Yes. We have a reception where we can speak to Father Stephanos as well, but if there are any questions, uh, I'll let you field your own questions. Sure. Yes. So when the Franks took Athens in 1205, does the cathedral then become, do they start Catholic services? Yes, it becomes the Roman Catholic cathedral, as happens with all major churches throughout the empire. It's one of the reasons that after uh, the Fourth Crusade and its aftermath, you have the, uh, the almost near disappearance of the cathedral office. All cathedral churches are taken over by Roman Catholic uh, priests or monastic orders. Professor Skerdos? Thank you, uh, Father uh, Stephanos. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused about how the plaster works on the inscriptions. Aren't the columns moving? 
They are fluted, yes. So where is this, uh, In the flutes. Inside the yes. They are pre pretty, uh, the, the columns are pretty big. I mean, uh, today uh, access is not allowed, so you look at the monument from a distance. I was very fortunate to obtain permission to actually go up there, and actually these are my pictures. I was actually on a scaffolding uh, looking at this inscription. And this whole, this is one flute, as you see here. This is one flute. Sorry? Uh, this is uh, 2011, I think. Um, yes, mother. Can I ask a follow up to Dr. Simmons' question? In the final cry of the evacuation at not being able to finish the cry, which we speculate is what the, that last, am I correct that that's what you're saying, the, that the last uh, call for mercy is? Are we to imagine that this is still used? Is it covered over? Uh, no. It, uh, all these inscriptions, well, let me get back to the plaster. No, 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 it's, it's a, a question is related. Um, we don't know exactly when the columns were plastered. Uh, that has, as far as I know, that has not been clearly dated. Uh, the, the Parthenon was, dest was destroyed by the Aerials in the third century. And it's hypothesized that because of the destruction, the damage by, fi by fire, the, the columns were plastered. And then you have the inscription. So it, they were not plastered to be inscribed. The plaster was there, and then the inscriptions took place. Now, the question that I did not address in this paper, and Father George forces me to address, is why this inscription on a column? I mean, obviously, this is a kind of like a liturgical directive or a liturgical manual. It tells you what to do, right? When and how, the musical tone. I don't have a good answer to that question. Plus, it's pretty high. From the current floor is two meters. That's what, three, six, no, six feet plus from the current floor. So. Well, in the Byzantine times, it, it was not as high, but still it was quite high. So it's not at eye level, so you can't really read it. And it's not that big, so you can read it from a distance. And one of my one uh, colleague um, uh, of mine, actually, uh, Professor Elena Velikovska, when I uh, you know, talked uh, to her about this project and shared uh, with her my research, suggested, and it's the only plausible hypothesis that I have, it possibly functioned as a marker for stational liturgy for procession. Um, but that's the closest I can get to an answer that makes sense. Uh, but I don't have a, a solid answer for that question. Uh, yes, please. No, no, you don't have a, 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 um, an intentional destruction. You don't. Um, remember, these are um, icons painted directly on the marble. The Parthenon has no roof, so it's exposed to the elements. You have pollution. So you would expect that, um, you know, the you know, there would be some deterioration. What I am saying is that, you know, after the Greek Revolution, um, obviously there was a, uh, the tendency to, for Greece to rediscover its classical past. It was, you know, we're celebrating the 200 years from the revolution. It was that classical past that made the, the Greek Revolution attractive to the, to the Westerners. You know, the Greeks were these, the descendants of the, uh, the, the, the re revolutionaries were the descendants of the Greeks. Uh, so at that time, the classical period was the peak of Greek civilization, up to the Hellenistic and the Roman times. 
everything after the Roman times was seen as a degradation of Hellenism. Hence, the Byzantine layers, the Frankish layers, the Ottoman layers were, you know, during the digs, because in the dig you have layers, because the Parthenon continued to be used during the Ottoman times. It was the church after 1453 was, was made a mosque, was continued to function as a mosque. Um, so, um, until quite recently, uh, the priority was let's reach the fifth century, the classical era, the heyday of civilization and art and everything else. Um, there was no interest in kind of like exploring the Byzantine layers. Uh, the, the, you have a shift that is taking place only in the last 30, 40 years where attention to the Byzantine layers and era is kind of like more pronounced. So it's not a deliberate, it's not a deliberate destruction. It's more of where the priorities lie. And the priorities do not lie on the preservation of the Christian elements of the Parthenon. And, and sorry, and uh, the biggest destruction of the Parthenon was caused by the bombing of Morosini in the 17th century that totally obliterated the building. It wasn't the Byzantines. It wasn't the Ottomans. In fact, the continuation of the use of the building is what preserved the building. As you well know, you have a space, you have a building, it's not used, it collapses. So the continuity of use is what actually preserved the Parthenon and the Acropolis. Yes, Professor Sorry. Um, fascinating. For the for the first for your first question, um, as I said, there are 232 inscriptions. Uh, many of them are clearly apotropaic. Um, one of them is a katara, a curse. <laughs> um, many of them are just uh, you know noting the death of a bishop. I mean, the the, the inscriptions are our best source for ecclesiastical history in Athens. Who was a bishop when? because they tell us the, the name of the bishop and the year that he died. And that way we can kind of like cross-reference it with other documents and kind of like trace the ecclesiastical history of Athens. Also, the dedication to whom this, ch was, this church was dedicated. There's one inscription that's dated to the sixth century quite early that, uh, I think it's, if I recall, sixth century, that, um, dedicates the church um, to, it's, it's, it says, Theotokia voithi Stefano anagnostu Agia Sophias, Dulu Christu ke Christianon adelfon. Apparently, at its beginning, the church was called Agia Sophia, not Panagia. So, uh, you know, these inscriptions kind of like, uh, the, the, first of all, inscriptions are of, of different kinds. And these inscriptions give us the, the vast information, historical information about the monument itself and who served in that monument. Now about the column, uh, that's something I admittedly I have not thought about. And it's something that would make sense, especially when you have prayers written on the columns. Um, it's interesting that the majority of the inscriptions lie on the, are on the columns on the front of the church. In other words, on the western part, as you enter, columns on, as, you, as you proceed east, inscriptions appear less and less on the columns. So it has to do something with visibility. 
uh, with people seeing the the, the prayers. Uh, you know, I have I have encountered examples of you know people uh, the practice of of going to a church and actually reading out loud what you read because the practice back then was actually the people didn't know of silent reading. You know, I'm reading it right now. That was never the practice in antiquity, even in late antiquity. You would read out loud whatever you read. So when people walked in and read these inscriptions, they would actually read out loud the prayer. So there was one of the motivations behind writing the inscription, because then someone, someone would always pray that prayer for you when they read the inscription. But I would need to look into uh, your very interesting comment about the power of columns. I'm currently working on scrolls, and scrolls definitely have that magical power. Uh, but uh, I need to look into the, the columns thing. So thank you so much. On that note, let us thank Father Stefan for one last time with a warm round of applause and then enjoy the Lord's Thank you. Thank you.